Good morning, church. We stand and worship with us today.
Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadow. This is just supposed to be a transition into announcements, Lord, but I think that you want to do something in this room right now. Because there's anxiety, there's hopelessness, there's fear, there's shame. God, in this room, there's hope because of you, because of your son. So God, I pray for my friends, I pray for my family in this room right now, Lord, as Acts 4 says, there is no other name no other name for which we find salvation other than the name of Jesus. So right now, Lord, begin to break down the walls that people are putting up between themselves and you, Lord. The fear that things cannot get better than they are right now, Lord, in Jesus' name they will. The fear that kids will continue to go astray, Lord, in Jesus' name, Lord, we pray for them to come closer and closer to you, Lord, for the anxiety that we feel inside, Lord, to begin 
to lessen because of who you are, because of what you do, Lord, for the shame, for the bondage. When Satan tries to remind us of what we've done because of Jesus' name, we can remind him of what you have done. God, right now, in this place, in this room, right now, Lord, because of the holy, the mighty, the precious name of Jesus, God, move. Move. God, we love you. God, I'm so thankful that you're such a good God that is worthy of our praise. We love you. In your son's name, all God's people said, amen. Why don't you guys have a seat for a second, and I'm going to compose myself. Uh, my name's Terrence, if we haven't met before. I'm one of the pastors around here, and in my hand, I have, I have a Connect card. Uh, on the seat back in front of you, there is a digital Connect card that will take you right to our uh, a QR that will take you right to our digital Connect card. And uh, this is the best way and the easiest way for us to connect you to each other, to the life of the church, but most importantly to Jesus by helping you take a next step. We have a bunch of announcements today. And so the first one is, is this. There's a women's retreat coming up. And I want to tell you, um, I've never been on a women's retreat, um, but I've been on many men's retreats. And I remember about eight years ago, I went to one men's retreat in particular that had a huge impact on me. And the reason it was able to have a huge impact is because at that time, I was able to escape from my normal everyday life, which included a lot of diapers. So I got away from the diaper changing. I got away from the meal prep. I got away from everything, and I got to focus solely on Jesus. And I'm telling you, for the, at that retreat, I finally went all in with Jesus. And what I want to do, what I want to ask you for you, if, if you're a lady here, please go out to the lobby, sign up for this. This is an opportunity for you to get away, to escape from the normal everyday life, to put in, be in a position where you get to hang out with and fellowship with other women. But this is what we want. At the end of this retreat, we want you to understand how obsessed God is with you. If you realize that in your daily life, how he's chasing after you, how he's pursuing you, it will change everything about life for you. The next announcement is that this Thursday we have our revival night. This is our worship night on steroids. It's going to be an amazing time of worship, of prayer, of us being able to turn our focus and our affection back to God. Make sure to join us for that. Lastly, kids camp starts tomorrow. This is how you can get involved. Pray. Pray. Pray for the leaders. <laughs> Pray for energy. Pray for fun. But also pray for this. There's going to be kids there who don't know who Jesus is. Pray that we have the opportunity to introduce them to a God who loves them exactly where they are and that they have an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Now, I'm wearing one of my favorite sweatshirts. It says, love thy neighbor. And normally when I, when I say love thy neighbor, I'm talking about the people around us. But within the context of the church, loving your neighbor is also a global thing. It's loving those on the other side of the globe. And so what we have today, we have a couple of missionaries from Honduras, from El Ayudante. We have Tristan and Beth Mohagan. I'd love to bring them out right now. And I want you guys to get to know them and hear a little bit about what God is doing in Honduras. How are you guys? We're good. That's good. It's good to see you guys. It's like we've done this last service. Um, <laughs> so when was the last time that Bay Hills, went, or the first time that Bay Hills went to um, El Ayudante? The first time was in 2013. A long time ago. That was a long time ago. So, 11 years. What has God been doing? Of what has the growth been like at El Ayanate since our first visit there? So, 11 years ago, we went with you guys to a community for the first time called El Misterio, and we did a VBS there, and it was the first time that El Ayanate or really any gringo was ever in that community. <laughs> and now the story is very different. Um, 10 years down the road, we now in that community, we're currently building a second story on a high school on that school campus. We have been in nearly every home in that community multiple times with the opportunity of meeting some physical need, but being able to share the gospel, being able to share our testimony and share the name of Jesus in their homes. 
We now in that same community have a discipleship group where there are young youth and adults hungry and growing in God's word. And we have a leadership committee that guides all of the outreach and all the projects we do in that community. And that's just one of many where we work, but it's special because it's where you guys helped us start. That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, we are partners with you guys. And we one of the things that we do with our partnership is that we are helping with uh, four scholarships for students. Tell us about those scholarships and the students, how they're being impacted by it, and also how the local community is being impacted by it. So we have almost 200 high school scholarships, and we've been able to learn that through education, it's a great opportunity to be able to share the gospel and disciple the next generation of leaders. And so you as a church sponsor for, we have other people in the church that are sponsoring people, uh, students as well. And these kids are otherwise would, they would be inhibited economically for, to be able to go to school. It's just too expensive. It's too overwhelming for their families. And they would. there's a very high dropout rate to instead work instead of going to school. And so because of the scholarship, we can help them have a better future um, realistically and economically. But at the same time, every single time they're coming into the tutoring center, we're going through a discipleship program with them. And we're seeing change, a total mental shift and a hunger for the Lord that's new. And that's very exciting. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. So we as a church support you, but individually, if people are galvanized towards helping, how? give us a couple of tangible ways that they could help you guys out. So we'd love to have you come back and talk with us at the end. We have um, some pictures of our family back there. If you want to support us as the Mohegans being there as your missionaries, there's a QR code on the back and information in this card. Take one home. Um, if you want to support El Udante, a really great way, the only one I'm going to share today, um, is helping our clinic. And so with 150 bucks, <clears throat> you can give medicine to 50 patients. And so about $3 a person, they come in with a physical ailment, and you're able to complete that, that they go home with the medication they need. So if that's something that strikes your fancy, we'll be in the back. We have a QR code. You can do it right from there. But that's one of many ways that we would love to share with how you could be involved in all that God's doing in Honduras. That's amazing. So please make sure to check them out in the lobby. Um, I'm going to say the same thing to you again. Don't grow weary of doing good. You're making Thank an amazing you. impact. And so... You guys are not just missionaries. You guys are friends. I, I met you right when you guys started dating. And so I, I love you guys. I love you guys. And honestly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for the impact you're having for the kingdom. Thank you. Guys. Well, we've come to the portion of our service when we get to be generous. Some of you weren't here last week, and I can tell. So for now on, when someone says we get to the portion of our service where we get to be generous, you say, because of your generosity, there's stuff going on around the globe to impact the kingdom. Because when we are generous, our God is faithful. So thank you so much for your generosity. Why don't you stand? Let's continue to worship. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come fly
so much for worshiping with us this morning. Just take a minute and just enjoy the presence of God. And then say hello to one of your neighbors.
Well, good morning, Bay Hills. There might have been three rows over here cheering, but honestly, the best compliment was from this guy in the second row. What's up, little Wes? <laughs> I will take that every day. So uh, last weekend was weird. It's a weird experience for me. Uh, if you don't know much about me, my story is very much a, by today's standard, you might call it an accelerated life, okay? So we got married uh, when we were 20 and 22, and yes, I was the younger one. Uh, <coughs> that, that took her just a second there. Uh, and then uh, within the first two years, we had our first baby, little girl, Celeste. And then 17 months later, I don't know how this happened, uh, but then there was another baby. Uh, and so what made last weekend so strange, what made it so different for me, uh, was basically for the first time since, like, really I graduated high school, uh, my wife took uh, both of the kids. She went to go see a good friend in Ohio, and because we have a big trip coming up in July, I actually stayed home. <laughs> All right. A little bit of a newfound freedom, you know? Like, maybe I could do something a little bit crazy, a little bit different. And so I was trying to decide. I, I was going through my list of things, like, there's a lot of stuff to do in the Bay Area, man. There's San Francisco. I can stay out as late as I want. I can go out with whoever I want to go out with. And so here's what I ended up doing. The very first day she left, I dropped her off at the airport. And then I've got this bachelor life for the next four days. And so I went crazy. On Thursday night, I finished up work. And you know what I did? I went to watch Inside Out 2. And it was awesome. <laughs> and the craziest part, I need you guys to be a little bit proud of me because this is stretching out of my comfort zone. The craziest part, the show time, it wasn't even until 8.45. So we're in line getting popcorn, and at 8.30, my watch is going off. Hey, bro, it's time to go to bed. Hey, it's time for your bedtime routine to start. Come on. But you know what? I, st I, I stuck it out. We watched the movie, and I'm so glad that I did because, honestly, not to throw shade, I feel like it's the first good Pixar movie that we've had in a while. They did an excellent job with it. And, and one of the things that really sets Pixar apart is their, it's just incredible storytelling, but I think something that gets overlooked a lot is their character design is so, so good. I mean, sadness with the glasses and the long hair. Hey, guys. Or if you saw the new one, Embarrassment, he's like this big dude, and then anytime something happens that makes him nervous, he like, he hides into his hoodie and his cheeks turn all red. It's like, it's just perfect, flawless. But there's this one character, this one new emotion from inside out to, and I worry, you know, the more that I think about it, if the way that she was designed might actually do more harm than good. And that character, you'll see her on the screen in just a moment, is Envy. I love the eyes, right? <laughs> it's like that is the exact same look that I get when I see like a vintage Mustang drive past me. I'm just like. <laughs> She's also the shortest of the emotions, which I find incredibly relatable. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, so then a couple days after watching it, I'm reading this interview, and it's with the lead psychologist on the project, okay? And he's talking about how when they were working with the designers, one of the intentions that they had for this character, for Envy, part of why she's so petite and cute and adorable, they wanted her to seem approachable. And he actually said in the interview, we wanted to help reshape a lot of the negative connotations that people have with the word envy. Hmm. An intentional effort on the part of the designers to reshape the way that we think about the emotion envy. But what if envy was less of a, a, an adorable, uh, bright-eyed, animated child, and what if envy was actually a toxic and sinful reality of living in a sinful and broken world? In fact, the Bible calls envy a work of the flesh in Galatians 5. You know what else is on that list? Debauchery, 
witchcraft, fits of rage, drunkenness, whoa, maybe envy is not quite as cute as Pixar would have us believe. But what is it that makes envy so dangerous? I mean, like, surely the consequences for just wanting something that somebody else has cannot be nearly as dangerous or as severe as something like witchcraft, right? But the truth we're going to unpack this morning is that I believe if you allow yourself to embrace envy, it will rob you of the joy that God has intended for your life. Envy exposes the reality of our discontentment. If my mind is so constantly consumed by what other people have that I do not have, then I will neglect to remember and to be grateful for all of the things other people don't have that I do have. So how can we root out our discontentment? How can we root out our envy at the source? I believe that discontentment ultimately is almost always the result of misdirected worship. We all worship something whether or not we choose to admit it. Could be a career, could be a relationship, could be money itself. But maybe, just maybe, if we could redirect our worship to one person, that person being God, We could all experience a bit less envy, a bit more contentment, and a heck of a lot more joy. Sound good? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by looking back at uh, at, uh, where we've been. So uh, uh, today I conclude a five-week series, Bless to Bless, which is accelerating revival beyond expectation. And guys, I don't know about you, but this generosity series has not felt like five weeks. It's felt like three months because every week is just a punch in the gut. Like, wow, I'm a lot more selfish than I thought I was. Wow, I'm a lot more discontent than I thought I was. Wow, I'm not nearly as generous as I ought to be. So let's look back at the last five weeks. Starting with week one, we discussed the prerequisites of generosity that generosity requires a new economy, and it also cr- uh, requires a new level of intentionality from us. In week two, Alan shared the purposes. Why bother with generosity in the first place? Well, first, it demonstrates our God who is himself generous. But second, it demonstrates our growth into becoming generous people, into becoming his image. In week three, we discuss the provisions of generosity, that generosity uh, provides equity within the church, but it also provides ministry for the church. And last week, Alan shared about the proofs of generosity, that real generosity is an accelerant and real generosity is a gift. So today, we're going to wrap up with the last of our two principles, the promotions of generosity, that Generosity promotes contentment, and generosity provokes worship. If you have your Bibles, we're going to continue in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand or grab one from underneath the chair in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, please accept one of ours as a gift to you. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get what? A generous crop. You must each decide in your own heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need, then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever, for God is the one who provides seeds for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. 
Principle nine, generosity promotes contentment. Well, what kind of contentment? A contentment that is grounded in hope. My mom loves to garden. Any green thumbs out there? No, there's this one here. So uh, uh, they moved about six months ago, so there hasn't been enough time to rebuild at the new home. But in their previous house, I mean, the list goes on and on. They had persimmons, plums, strawberries, tomatoes, lemons, onions, zucchinis, herbs, on and on and on. Amazing. So impressive. I remember uh, the first time my daughter, she was, uh, I think, two years old at the time, she found out that she could pick the strawberries by herself and eat them. And so uh, I didn't, I wasn't paying as close attention as I should have. But she's out there eating all these strawberries, and then she runs in through the door who did you kill out there? Oh, my gosh. Just like red all over her face. Uh, and it was so cool to just get to see her, like, enjoying this thing that had been invested in for such a long time. See, she had this list of all these incredible fruits and vegetables. But when they first moved to that house, it did not start that way. It was years and years of investment of purchasing seeds, of purchasing equipment, of watering, of tending, of curating that led to long-term this beautiful garden that we got to enjoy the fruits of. And I think it's no accident that the Bible in our passage for today uses uh, 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 the illustration of planting a seed and yielding crop for what it means for us to be generous. It is a long and challenging and arduous process. Because in the same way, meaningful generosity, meaningful investment takes time and energy. And I think one of the greatest challenges for us in our cultural moment and when it comes to being generous is we are so accustomed to instant gratification. I mean, I could pull out my phone right now, go on Amazon, look up anything I want, press buy now, And the next screen will be like, yeah, we delivered that half an hour ago because we knew you were going to buy that. (laughs) I mean, it's incredible. We want what we want, and we want it when? We want it now or yesterday, as Manny says. The problem with taking that mindset into generosity is that sometimes generosity takes years to reap meaningful rewards. There was a mentor uh, that told me when I first started in youth ministry, he's like, I hate to... I hate for this to be one of the first things that you hear. (laughs) But he said, you will not see the rewards for your hard work in youth ministry until you have been saving the same group of kids in the same church for at least two years. And for some of those kids, they may uh, they may not uh, experience the impact of what you did for them until they're grown up, and they might even not even mention it to you. So much of ministry, so much of what we're called to do is this investment in something we may never see the rewards of. But if we're hungry for the now, if we're hungry for the instant gratification, here's the great irony. Your generosity will actually lead you to discontentment. Because you're not giving with a hope for the future. You're giving with an expectation for the present. So if you don't see the result that you want to see, then the generosity stops because your so-called generosity was actually just your attempt to control or to manipulate something or someone else. But hopefulness, hopefulness, it, it relinquishes the illusion of our control. Hopefulness says, God, you could do so much more with the resources, the time, the treasure, the talent that I have. So, God, I am going to give it to you, hoping and trusting and having faith that you are going to turn this into something so much more beautiful than I could possibly hope or imagine. The second type of contentment that generosity promotes is a contentment that is driven by love. 
verse 9 of our passage says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. That's the NLT. But I love the way the NIV says it. It says, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Imagine that with me for a moment. That someone could be so generous, they are willing to take what they have and scatter it out for people in need. I kind of, as I was making my notes, I imagined it like a garage sale, but everything just says free. (laughs) And it's not in like a flippant or, or a demeaning way or being wasteful, but it's this detachment from all of the stuff that we hold so tightly to. It is, in other words, letting go of my wants for the sake of others' needs. So ask yourself this question. What would it look like if I loved others so deeply that I was willing to give up what I was most attached to for their good? In fact, what would it look like if God was willing to give up what he was most attached to for the sake of our good? John 3.16, for God what? So loved the world, he gave what? His one and only Son. He was so driven by love that he let go of the thing he most desired for our sake. And now we, as image bearers, we have the opportunity to do the same thing. To say, I am not going to hold on to these things that I love so dearly if it means that I can help somebody else who is in need. The third type of contentment that generosity promotes is a contentment filled with joy. Now, I don't know if anybody else has the same baggage, but I really struggle with the word contentment. Like when I hear the word content, I don't imagine like peaceful and relaxed and happy and joyful. I imagine somebody that's just like in a room without any passion or like without any drive or without any motivation So, like, an example would be, uh, when I hear the word contentment, I I almost imagine, like, a conversation with one of my friends, and he's been uh, unemployed for the last three months, but he has people that he needs to take take care of. And so you go up and you ask him, hey, man, just checking in on you. Has there been any, like, progress or movement forward? And they just kind of say, like, oh, you know, I'm working on it, but I'm not really in a rush. Or if any of you have, like, teenagers in the room, I imagine a conversation with a teenager, teenager where you're like, hey, are you planning to do anything today other than playing video games and being on your phone in your room? And they're like, no, no, I'm good. I'm content. I'm happy. I'm good. Or like that friend that keeps complaining, you know, I want to get into shape. I want to work out. I'm going to do it this time. And then you're like, hey, man, you want to go to the gym? That's eh, more of like a 2025 <laughs> kind of thing. You know, like, I'll get to that. I, And and so for me, a lot of times I imagine that contentment means I just have to diminish all of my passion. If I just didn't want anything, then I'd be content, right? But what if God wanted more for us than that? What if instead of getting rid of your passion, getting rid of your drive, getting rid of your excitement, what if God's will is that all of that would be fulfilled in the one person that truly can, Jesus Christ. My passion would be fulfilled. My drive would be fulfilled. And in so doing, I could experience a contentment that, God, you have this under control, and I can be joyful in the midst of my striving and joyful in the midst of my contentment because what I'm striving for is you. The pathway to joyful giving is paved by meeting our deepest needs and desires in a God who loves and cares for us. If we continue in our passage, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 11, it says, yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. First, the needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, 
and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God for your generosity to them, and all believers will prove that you are obedient to the gospel, to the good news of Christ. And they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace that God has given to you. Thank God for this gift too wonderful for words. Our final principle of this series is that generosity promotes worship. Where? First, it promotes worship within ourselves. I love that language, enriched in every way. It comes from this Greek word, plutizo, and it means to make wealthy. It means to to cause to abound or to overflow. Uh, uh, And for those of us who have accepted Christ, we know that we have been made wealthy. He went from riches to rags so that we could go from rags to riches. But what I love about this this verb, it's in the present passive tense. So what does that mean? Passive means it is something that happens to us, not because of it. I am not enriched because uh, uh, I did X, Y, Z. I am not enriched because I read my Bible uh, for a month straight. I am not enriched because of this. Those are all good things, but ultimately enrichment is a gift that God gives freely to us, passive, but it is also present, and this is so cool, which means that it is ongoing. It is not something that is finished. God saved me, but man, God also saves me. God enriched me, but man, he enriches me every day. God was faithful, faithful to the point of a cross, and yet he is faithful, and he will be faithful, even in the smallest moments, even in the little bits of pain, even in the little bits of struggle, he is there with me. That is the God that we worship. His mercies begin afresh every morning. You know, as a worship leader, one of my greatest challenges You guys get it, man. You have jobs. Sometimes a job is a Monday morning, and you're like, ugh, I don't want to be here. And if I'm being, like, totally blunt, Sunday for me actually is my Monday. And sometimes it's like, ugh. (laughs) Nothing against you guys. Just is, right? So one of the biggest challenges for me as a worship leader, how do I keep the worship from becoming a mundane, going through the motions, get up, sing the songs, get off the stage, drive home, take a nap. How do I prevent that from happening? And what I have found to be so, so helpful for me, it is so simple. I have to keep my eyes open. God, what did you do this week in my life? God, how did you show up for me this week? How were you good and gracious and forgiving? Where was your mercy that is afresh every morning? Where do I actually see it? Because if I can see it, then I go, God, I can't help myself. I got to worship you. You've been so good to me. How can I not? And so, church, if you walk into here on a Sunday morning and you say to yourself, I know we're singing about how God is good and everything, but, like, I just don't feel a reason to worship him. And you look back on your Monday and your Saturday and you're like, "Ah, I feel like it wasn't there. Church, it is not because God was not there Monday through Saturday. It's because you didn't have your eyes open to see it. Because our God is worthy of worship. Our God is so (laughs) beyond what we could possibly understand. So our our worship begins uh, within ourselves but it was really never intended to stop there. Point number two, generosity promotes worship amongst the church. In verse 12, it says, two good things will result from this ministry of giving. First, the needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met, and two, they will joyfully express their thanks to God. 
Paul is clear in this passage. The reason that the uh, believers in Jerusalem are able to worship is because of the generosity of the Corinthians to them. What a scary idea that our generosity or our lack of generosity has an impact on other people's worship. Now, for me, I'm very much, I was just talking to Pastor Luis about this. I'm very much a visual thinker. Uh, uh, I, I, I learn a, a lot through visuals. So here's my best uh, shot at summarizing the truth of this passage into an image. See, first, <clears throat> God provides for us like he always does, right? And he provides so much that there's an overflow. And because of that, now I get to be generous towards other people. And those others are inspired, what? To worship the God who is the source of that grace and goodness to begin with. Here's the problem. Like we do with all things, sin, the result of a a broken, fallen world, means that we take this beautiful structure that God has designed and we corrupt it. So I also put together three counterfeit worship cycles that we are uh, uh, very prone to falling for. The first one is this. God provides for us like he always does. Then I overflow. I get to be generous with others. But instead of acknowledging the source of my grace, the source of all that I have, I accept the worship for myself. This is the billionaire that invests in charities and then soaks up all of the praise and the admiration uh, because they're just such a generous person. This is the worship leader that starts to think, maybe it's my own musical giftedness that causes people to be transformed, not the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that gifted me in the first place. This is all of us at one point or another when we lack the humility to admit that nothing good uh, 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 from us originated with us. The second one we fall for is this. Oh, man, this one's a doozy. (laughs) We see God providing for others just like he always does. Then we see them worship God as they should for what he's provided. But all the while we're asking in our minds, What about me? This is the woman that she would just be the most generous person in the world. She swears it. I'd be the most generous person in the world if I just had as much to give like the Joneses do. This is the the self-pitying man that is so consumed by anger and by jealousy because other people have all of the talents and the abilities and the things that he wants. This is all of us. When we are so consumed by, here it is, envy for the gifts that God has given others, we don't recognize and appreciate the gifts he's given us. And the third one, the third counterfeit cycle is probably the most dangerous. It's subtle. It's widespread. At first glance, it actually looks pretty good. You're like, this makes a lot of sense. For a lot of people in this room, myself included at times, this summarizes what I think worship is. God provides for me. I worship him. I let others worry about themselves. This is the middle, uh, middle class Christian family that ticks all of the boxes of like what it means to be a good Christian but then kind of ignores and skirts around the part where Jesus says, what about the poor and the widow? This is the ministry leader that convinces himself, all I got to do is know God more. If I just spend more time in prayer, if I understand my Bible better, then all the people that I'm leading, they'll be changed, they'll be transformed. I don't have to bother talking to them or interacting with them or caring about them. This is, if we're honest, most of us, when we're convinced we don't have enough to give others and we turn the Christian life into a solo journey it was never intended to be. Like a counterfeit $100 bill, that actually looks really good until you compare it with the real one. 
the real one says, God provides for me. I am generous with others. And those others worship God. I had this question that I wrote down when I was brainstorming this section. And I kept going back and forth. I'm like, I don't know if I should say this. <laughs> this might be a little bit much. Um, but I'm going to share it with you guys. Do not take it as definitive. Do not take it as prescriptive. Do not let it define your the theology. But sit with it. Let the Spirit speak to you through this question. Is it possible that God... God is being robbed of his worship because of my lack of generosity. I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it isn't. But it's a question worth considering. Generosity promotes worship, not just within ourselves, not just amongst the church, thank God, but also beyond the church. Verse 14, and they will pray for you with deep affection because of the overflowing grace God has given you. I love that image, overflowing. So if you were an, uh, an Orthodox Jew, you'd have this one day in the week that was very, very special. Okay, it's called Shabbat. We call it usually Sabbath in the Christian tradition. Uh, and this one time per week, it's a, it's a whole day that's dedicated to I'm going to stop, I'm going to rest, I'm going to worship, and I'm going to delight in my Savior. And at the conclusion of this time, the conclusion of this Sabbath, they have this ceremony. It's in five parts, but I'm going to focus on one part. This one part is called the Kiddush, or the Cup of Blessing. Let's put that up on the screen. So as you're concluding the, the rest part of your week and you're getting ready to enter into your work week, right, the six days of work, first, a, a blessing is recited over that, uh, that bottle of wine, acknowledge, acknowledging that God is the one who created the fruit. He was the source of it in the first place. Then the kiddush, right, the cup is filled to the point that it's overflowing, symbolizing the abundance of God's blessing. And here's the best part. They don't just let it overflow onto the floor or onto the, uh, the table or into like a, a, a drain or something like that. No, they put this little basin there. That represents our loved ones. That represents our community. That represents our church. And as the cup begins to overflow, it fills the basin around it and says, God, your grace is so good. You have been so plentiful and generous with me. You have empowered me to be generous with other people. I'll finish with this. The very last verse of our passage for this series says, thank God for this gift too wonderful for words, verse 15. But a better translation, if you look into the Greek, would be thank God. God for his gift. Whose? Jesus himself. See, God challenges us to plant generously and promises that uh, those seeds will reap generously, but the cool thing is God never asks us to do something that he would not be willing to do himself. Think about this. 2,000 years ago, God buried his seed in the ground. Literally, his son was buried in a tomb. And yet, what have we reaped as a result of him planting that? Estimates claim that, you know, since Jesus lived and, and died and rose again, something like 7.7 .7 billion people have been reconciled into a relationship with God. 7.7 .7 billion. Now, this is a jar of rice. As a Filipino, I keep this with me at all times. <laughs> if you want to join me for karaoke in the parking lot later. Uh, you can't even see it, most of you. One grain of rice. One man, Jesus Christ himself, fully dedicated, fully generous. And as a result of that, 7.7 .7 billion souls saved. If I took 
7.7 billion grains of rice, and I lined them up end to end heading east, which is that way. I looked it up, by the way. I lined them up. It would stretch around the world, back to this very spot, across the United States, and it would land somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. 7.7 billion. That's what we've been able to reap because of what God sowed 2,000 years ago. So don't you tell me God can't bring revival to the East Bay. Don't tell me you don't have enough and that God can't use what little offering that you have to give him because our God is so good. Our God is so generous. He takes what little we have to offer and he expands it beyond imagination. Church, would you close your eyes with me and we're gonna imagine for a moment. Imagine with me every person in this room joyfully and generously planting their time, their talents, and their treasures. Imagine with me God taking that generous offering and expanding it beyond what we could possibly hope or imagine. And here's the best part. Imagine, me, imagine with me our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, our unsaved family members, worshiping God wholeheartedly because of the overflowing grace God has given to the people in this room. Now open your eyes. I don't know about you, but that's a future I want to be a part of. And it starts when we decide to be generous. Let's stand and continue in worship together. Church, join me as we sing and declare that Christ is our firm foundation. Oh, Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking.
church for joining us today. Um, as I pray over you throughout the week, I pray that you receive his message, you receive his word, and if there's anything that is heavy on your heart, we have a prayer team on my right to your left just waiting to pray for you. Have a good Sunday.